God has blessed us in 2023. Many sitting here have been involved in one form or another in ministry, in the church or individually. I think everyone here and listening probably have been involved at least in prayer or with hands-on. So thank you. We've, we've distributed literature before and after the fair, but also especially at the fair. We have uh, given Bible studies. Uh, we've <clears throat> sung songs up front when it may not be totally comfortable and, and, and laid in children's story. Shree, thank you for the story. And thank you, ladies, for leading in the music. <clears throat> we are blessed with the freedoms we have and the opportunities we have. Let us pray for divine appointments all year in 2024. Time is short, brother and sister. It's short. If you look at the news, it's short. Jesus is coming again. If you look at the, the, the economics, Jesus is coming again. Men's hearts are what? Failing them for fear. Did Jesus say that? Is that fulfilled more now than almost any other time in, in history in the world? Oh, my. There's so much. I ask you to do me one more favor. And really, it's not me. It's God asking you, I think, to do this. And that is, make a prayer list. Now, I'm not good at this. Meredith and I have talked about it this morning. I've made out a list. I lost the list. I've made out a list. I lost the list. I ask you to try it one more time with me. Make a list of 10 names of people that don't follow Christ, that are not dedicated to Jesus, that need to give their heart to Jesus. Or, I'll tell you a story in just a second, but or make a list of 10 names. Write down your request for that name. And write a Bible promise beside that name. And every day, this year, dedicate your life to praying for them. Because what's coming in September? You know what's coming in September? Eric Frecking is coming here. He was here a few years ago. And people gave their hearts to Jesus and have had a beautiful walk with Christ. I, you know, it, it's a blessing to see the gospel working. Eric Frecking is coming back in September. 2024. He'll be here at Elkhart preaching, sharing the gospel message. Let us pray for his ministry, our ministry, that will prepare a people that are ready to hear a message that they need to hear, that we need to hear. Amen? I think of the story of a little old lady, a little widow, years ago that went to a camp meeting, I won't say where, um, went to a camp meeting, and she went to the evangelism hour, Sabbath afternoon, at camp meeting. How many of you have, I don't want to ask that question, but uh, those that have been to camp meeting know that evangelism hour is where they share stories of how people have given their heart to Jesus that year and have become active sharing the gospel with others around them that year. And so she was so inspired, she went to the speaker, the conference president, and said, Sir, I, I appreciate the testimonies. This is exciting, but I have nothing that I can do. I, I don't have a lot of money. I, I don't have skills. I can't give a Bible study. What can I do? What can I do? And he says, thought for a second, he says, well, can you pray? And, and, and many, many of you may have heard the story, but she said, well, yeah, I can pray. He says, make a list of 10 names and pray for them every day and see what God will do by this time next year. Come back next year and let's see what God has done. And so she did. She went home. Who do I know? I don't know anybody. So she, back then they had phone books. And she opened the phone book, and she put her finger on the name and wrote it down, and the address and the phone number. 
name, address, phone number, name, address, phone number. And then she put a request beside each name. And then she put a Bible promise beside each request. And guess what happens at the end of the year? At the end of the year, Evangelism Hour, she has her list in her purse. What happens at the end of the year? Eight of the ten, eight of the ten have been baptized. Several of them are active in outreach and in church ministries already. Praise God. This is a story from years ago. Can God still do the same today? Yes? He's the same yesterday and today and when? So Jesus comes forever. <clears throat> I think God is asking us to take a bold step forward and ask him for more this year than last, right? Amen? Amen. <clears throat> Let's look at the story of the in the Bible of the book. We're looking at Jeremiah, but we're going to look at the story of Josiah. And Josiah, with the story, he was a boy king, right? He was eight years old when he was made king, and his uncle Jehoiada, what, helped give him guidance in how to be a king as a boy. And he was faithful for many years. <clears throat> for many years, he was king, and he brought great reformation. Probably one of the greatest reformations in the history of Judah and Israel. He brought them back from idol worship which they weren't supposed to participate in. He brought them back from distraction from the world. He brought them back, and he began to clean up the sanctuary. And as he cleaned out the trash that had been thrown into the sanctuary and began to use the sanctuary, in a corner they found the Torah, the book of the law. And he said, oh, let's read it. And he began to implement the reforms that are written of in the law. What does the law teach us? You know, some Christians, some pastors in some denominations say, it's been done away with. It's all nailed to the cross. Is that true? Is it gone? Or is it still applicable to us today? As he began to make the reforms, people began to recognize God is God. He is supreme. He's a loving God. He is promised to take my sin. This lamb represents, we know today, Jesus. And he has promised to take my sin and die for me. I don't understand what that means. But he has a plan for my life. What a great reformer. What a great change. What a difference he made in Israel. But when, his, when he died in a battle he wasn't supposed to be in, the work of reformation wasn't done yet, but it had gone great strides in the right direction. Now his son, Jehoahaz takes the reign. And the Bible records Jehoahaz did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. What does that mean? It means that he took away the people. He influenced the people to go away from God worshiping God, a loving God, a God who's going to die in my place so that I can have eternal life to worship idols, Baal, and other idols from surrounding nations. Actually, there were 
four more, four kings after Josiah. That was the end of Judah as a nation. Those four kings after Josiah were his four sons. Jehoahaz, Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, and Zedekiah. And all of them, every one of them, rebelled against the God of creation, rebelled against the worship in the sanctuary service, which taught Jesus is the Lamb of God. Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus is the light of the world. And on and on on. Our hope is in him, right? It's not in me. It's not in what I do. It's in him. And they led the people away from that worship. They led them in evil in the sight of the Lord. And God sent Jeremiah again and again and again, telling the kings of the judgment coming. And the Reformation needed. His ministry began the last 13 years of Josiah's ministry, and he told Josiah, and Josiah obeyed. But the sons didn't follow the life of the father. And God says, do this and live. Repent, turn back from, from rebelling and going to, when Babylon is rising, going to Egypt. Now, what does Egypt represent in the Bible? False worship and slavery, bondage, right? And he's saying, turn away. Don't go to Egypt for your answer. When Babylon's rising, come to me and surrender to the king of Babylon. Babylon's confusion. But the God of heaven, through Jeremiah, is saying, surrender and live. Yield to God and live, right? Is he saying this to us today? Surrender, follow me, turn away from sin. If you have anything that's in front of God, give it up and live. Let's turn to Jeremiah chapter 18, first, uh, verses 8 to 10. And, and Jeremiah told Jer uh, God told Jeremiah, to go to a potter's house. As he watched the potter make the vessel, uh, but it became marred. It's no good. So he scooped it off the pedestal, and he began to make it again. And this time, it was good. And he kept it, and he set it aside to to uh, prepare it for service that it was to do. And God, let's, let's look at verse 5 first, actually. Verse 5, Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter? Says the Lord, Look, as the clay is in the hand of the potter, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. The instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning the kingdom to pluck it up and pull it down and destroy it, if that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil and will re relent uh, from, of its disaster that I thought to bring against it, and in instant I, I speak concerning a nation and concerning the kingdom to build it up, and to plant it if it does evil in my sight, so that it does not obey my voice, then I will relent concerning the good which I said I would benefit it. So we have a message from Jeremiah to the kings, the last five kings, 
The first one listened. The last four didn't. And every time he spoke to them, Nebuchadnezzar came and conquered them one more time, put a new king in place. There's a lot of history that we don't have time to cover because we want to get to the point and not keep you here till the evening time. <clears throat> but God says, what? Repent. Turn away from your sins and live. Turn back to following after me and live. If you turn away to the gods of this world, destruction's coming. Destruction's coming. <clears throat> Let's look at Isaiah chapter 46. A different prophet, different time. Is this the same message? This is not the second prophet I'm going to be speaking about, though. This is another prophet. Isaiah 46, verses 9 and 10 says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God, there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times, things that are not yet done. Saying, My counsel shall stand. I will do all my pleasure. Is God's pleasure good? Or evil. It's good. He has a plan for your life and mine. And that is to give us guidance and direction to the most happiest life we can have. Does that mean we'll have no trouble or trials or sickness or illness or death? No. It doesn't mean any of those things. It means that he will give us strength if we have them to walk with him through that valley of the shadow of death. Whether it's pain, whether it's suffering, whether it's illness, or whether it's trouble, many of the reformers, after Christ's death, many of the, the apostles and the reformers through all the centuries since Jesus was here on earth, died for their faith were persecuted, were stoned, were defeated. As Jeremiah, he went and told Zedekiah, God's counsel. Zedekiah put him in a miry pit. What's a miry pit? Scott, forgive me, but it's basically a septic tank that's a little full. And he's in this pit for months. And eventually, Zedekiah says, I really want to know God's counsel. So he takes him out of the pit, and he says, what's your counsel? He took him to a secret place because Zedekiah knew that if he took him to the main place of meeting, that Zedekiah's counselors would kill, Zedekiah, would kill Jeremiah. And so he took him to that secret place, and he says, what's your counsel? And Jeremiah says, hey, why do you ask me? You've asked me, and you put me in the pit. And, and you've asked me, and nobody's following what I say. You're just going to kill me. And as he, you know, Zedekiah stopped and said, no, I will not kill you. I will protect you. And from that counsel, when Jeremiah told him, surrender to the king of Babylon and it will go well with you. Your, your family will be kings throughout generations, forever. But if you go to Egypt and seek help from Egypt and don't surrender to the king of Babylon, you and your royal um, reign and family will all die. Zedekiah 
didn't follow his counsel. He didn't obey Jeremiah's calling him back to worship God, so to surrender to a king that seems like you shouldn't surrender to. Kings don't surrender. They, they battle. They war. They, they win battles. Jeremiah is calling him to a different walk. Is God calling you and I to a different walk than the world is walking today? Yes, he is. He's calling us to walk with him, to surrender to him, to yield to him. To yield the gods of our lives. Surrender to him. And allow him to be first. God. In my life. In our lives. And then he promises to give us life. Not only here and now, more abundant, but everlasting life. Let's look at another Bible promise. This is our memory, ver- our, our uh, text for this morning. It's Second Chronicles seven fourteen. Many of you know it by memory, and and you can say it with me if you want to. But I'm going to read it because I'm up front here, and it is a promise to us, not only to them in the Old Testament, but to us today. His promises never change. Let's look at it together. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, heal their land. Verse 15 is just the cap on top of this whole thing. He says, now I, my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer of in this place. He's saying, I'll hear you and I'll answer the best way for your benefit. It's for the benefit of all around you. So where is your influence falling today? Daily. God's calling us to a different walk than the world's walking. All the world around us is going one direction, pell-mell toward destruction. He's calling us to walk with him, to walk with God, to follow his directions. Matthew 4, verse 4, when Jesus was tempted and, and uh, tested, in the, in the wilderness during his prayer and his fasting before he began ministry. Matthew 4, verse 4, Jesus answered the tempter was with thus says the Lord. Many of you can uh, say it from memory, but I'm going to read it because I'm up front here. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. We have many things around us in the world today. Sometimes these things, and I'm not criticizing, I'm sharing, we're all in the same boat. Sometimes these things become first in our lives. Sometimes the first thing I look at is my phone to answer a text or an email. And on and on and on. So is it it the phone? Is it the internet? Is it an app? Is it the house? Is it the car? Is it the savings? Is it the job? Is it the business? What is it that's first in my life? Is there anything that's before God? I'm not talking to you. I'm sharing this is the world we live in. This is the challenge we face. The devil is doing the same thing to us he did to Christ. He's tempting us in our wilderness experience, in our life here on earth, in our challenges. He's, he's tempting us to do 
not to put things where we shouldn't put them, and to supplant God's position with these things. And I'm only calling you to the same message that these two prophets, one we've mentioned and we haven't yet, called the people then, and they're still calling us today to do, to seek God and live. Zedekiah had every privilege in the world. His dad was the greatest reforming king in the history of that country. He had the right education, the right religion, the right country, the right family, but he rebelled against the Most High God. He said, no, I'm going to worship these idols. Oh, terrible. And I can say, why would he do that? But human nature is that we all follow that pattern naturally, right? I'm no different than Zedekiah, except one thing. The Holy Spirit lead me in a different direction, right? Yeah? As the Holy Spirit can lead me away from idol worship, and away from putting other things first, and into putting God first in my life, then we see the promise is for us. He's promising you and I. Nebuchadnezzar is another king. He is a pagan. He is a ruthless, uh, powerful, powerful king. He's known as a fierce warrior and then as a battle-hardened king. He goes from nation to nation, conquering and doing what he wants in those kingdoms. And you think, there's no hope for that man. There's no way he could be saved, right? But we look at the life of Nebuchadnezzar, and he conquers Judah, and he takes back four slaves, makes them eunuchs, abuses them, mistreats them, and then he starts to train them to be princes in his kingdom. He gives them a new diet. He gives them a new name. He gives them everything new, changes everything, or he thinks he does. Daniel and them work it out so they can have their diet back. And they have it, they, they talk to the king, and after the first test, that they were supposed to be executed, and they answer the king's request to know the truth about the dream, the king makes Daniel second in the kingdom. And this slave prophet tells the king what's coming down. The king says, where did you get this? You're the second in the kingdom. And he says, Daniel says, no, 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 it's not me. It's the God of heaven. So what Zedekiah, what all these sons of Josiah were supposed to do, Daniel does. And now the king of Babylon does what he was supposed to do in the first place. But Judah isn't involved. They missed it. I don't want to be in Judah's shoes during that time. I want to follow the pattern of Daniel and his friends. I want to follow the pattern of King Nebuchadnezzar where he sees this is the real deal. This is the God of heaven. There's nobody else that can do this. You're his representative. You're second in the kingdom. Yeah. 
Nebuchadnezzar in stages surrenders to the God of heaven. Chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, and chapter 4, there is differing and progressive testimonies of his surrender to the God of heaven. And chapter 4 is the pinnacle. Let's go to Daniel chapter 4 and look at his testimony as king of the world, the then known world. He now, as king, recognizes who God is and who is to be worshipped. And he extols the God of heaven. Daniel 4, verse 34 and 35. And this is the king speaking, and he's telling his testimony. He's not commanding his country, his reign, realm, to, to worship God. He's not commanding, do this or die. He's saying, you're the God of heaven. That very hour, I'm sorry, uh, and at the end of the time, this is the seven years of his insanity, the kingdom was kept for him, and he is brought back to reality, and he says, at the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lift my eyes to heaven, my understanding returned to me. I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. This was what Zedekiah was to do. This is what uh, all these Jehoahaz and all these were supposed to do. They were supposed to draw people to a worship and a praise of the only God that's worthy of our praise and glory and honor. Amen? For his dominion is an everlasting dominion. His kingdom is from generation to generation. He's not saying, I'm king and I'm going to last forever. He's saying, you are the king of heaven. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will and in, uh, in his army in he of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, no one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? So he's saying, you're God. And this is his personal testimony. Go back to verses 26 and 27 in the same chapter. He said, inasmuch, this is Daniel giving counsel, I think, if I remember correctly. Yes, uh, inasmuch as uh, they gave the command to leave the stump and the roots of the tree, your kingdom shall be assured to you, and your uh, you, after you come to know <clears throat> that heaven rules. Therefore, O king, let my advice be acceptable to you. Break off your sins, be righteous, your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. Perhaps there may be a lengthening of your prosperity. And the last word we have from Nebuchadnezzar is praise to the God of heaven. So the same message from Jeremiah and Daniel. What? Turn to God and live. Turn to God and prosper. Amen? He's saying the same thing. His message is the same to us. Today. Turn to God and live. Turn to God and prosper. He desires good for all mankind. But we have something we have to do. We have to turn to Him and yield my life our lives to him. Was John the Baptist's message the same? Yes, it was. It was the same. Turn and live. Repent. Be baptized. 
and that this is newness of life, right? <clears throat> Zedekiah's witness could have been that of Nebuchadnezzar. But it wasn't. He had all the privileges. He had all the opportunities. He had everything going for him. But he rebelled. He did not follow. 